So we're going to run through 11 books. They call it the minor prophets and the major prophets. Major prophets, it's just because it's a lot that the guys wrote. So major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and Hosea. And then there's another 11 books. And they call it the small prophets, not because they were small, but because it was a small letter. Nothing big or small about the guys, actually. But we're going to start at the back. We go with Malachi. Are you with me? Malachi, can you write down, please? One or two or three. Get your Bible. Write down. Give that as a legacy to your child or your grandchild. With all the detail what God said to you in your life. Malachi. Accuracy, humility. Everybody say accuracy, humility. The last book, the last book written down for us, and what there was the last book before God can keep silent for a lot and a lot and a lot of years before Jesus would come to earth. So the last things that he would want to deal with, that's what we are talking about. And in that is, he will send his accurate messenger. He will send the messenger. And the messenger will prepare the way of the Lord. And who was that? John the Baptist. So God is saying, I'm going to send the messenger. And the messenger will prepare the way of the Lord. And then silent for how many years? 400. 400 years. Wow. For 400 years, God kept silent. Oh, yes, because he said, I've said enough. They must take that. They must look at it. And with the last book, when he's talking about accuracy, he said, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. That was John the Baptist. My brother, my sister, if you're an accurate messenger, if your message is accurate, it will always prepare the way for Jesus. Jesus will manifest in what you believe, in what you say, in the message that you live. Some or other spirit going to manifest in the message that you live. You live and you focus the most in your life on the message of stress, the message of crisis management, the message of you and some whatever thing that you need. Some or other spirit going to manifest there. Not because you invite him, but because you didn't invite the Holy Spirit. How did, would you invite the Holy Spirit? By looking at the message of the word. Because he will only manifest through this word. In no other money. message he will manifest. Consuming fire, yes, for any other message. But only through the word. Prepare the way of the Lord. How? Get into the word. Prepare the way. In. And he was a voice in the wilderness, John the Baptist. Hey, And you start... To be a voice in your wilderness. And Jesus will manifest himself in the wilderness. But start to bring the voice in the wilderness. We're talking about voices. You need to bring forth the word of God as a voice in your wilderness. And Jesus, the baptizer in fire and in the spirit. He will manifest himself in your wilderness. Don't stand one side and you wait for God to change the wilderness. And then you will enter. Because he confirmed the word by changing the wilderness. No. He confirmed it through the cross. You stand on the word and you speak into the wilderness. And you get into your wilderness. You, you walk through your wilderness, John the Baptist. Hello? As a messenger and through what you speak, you will prepare the way. You will prepare the way. Make the way. God, I give, I give you the way. I give you the right to come and do what you want to do. That's one thing to say. But practically, it means the word must be in your heart. Because the Spirit will only move on the word. The Spirit will only move on the word. You have nothing of the word of God in your prayer. God will not move. Spirit of God is moved by the word. Amen. Accuracy, accuracy. But you know, one of the, it didn't come out in any other book like that in the Old Testament, in all the books, except in Malachi, it's coming out that, verse 2, God will say, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? 
Hello? And for six, seven, eight times, the whole time. But you asked. But you ask, how have we defiled you? How have we done this? How have we done that? You weary me with your words. Just further, in the next chapter in Malachi. If you make sure, want to make sure you not, will not be accurate with God's voice, question everything. No, but I just want to know. They didn't go in rebellion. They just, God would say something and they would ask, where did we do that? How did we do that? Why you say we did that? No, that's just inquiring. But it's such a fine line. And there, in the midst of all of those six, seven, eight times where they did that in those four chapters in Malachi, God said, you weary me with your words. That it became arrogance. You know, the other... The other point was humility. When I come with humility, I will understand the fear of God. I will have respect for God. If I don't humble myself, I will not respect Him. It's two sides of the coin. You cannot honor Him if you not come with humility. Honor and humility is going the, going the same way. The hell and the devils and Lucifer will honor Him, but not from a place of humility. They will be humiliated. And from a place of shame, they will have to honor. But humility is from a place of worship where you will honor. And from a place of worship and that humility, you need to honor. That's where the fear of God is. So, so you find a lot of verses in Malachi about the fear of God. Chapter 1, he says, if I'm your father, where is my respect? Where is my honor from you? And they said, then, where did we not honor you? The more the respect and the fear of God is on your life, the less you're going to take the question mark out. The last book, before 400 years before Jesus comes, God wants to deal with a question mark in our lives, that we will so easily question something, and we can call it, we just evaluate. We just want to know. But it's not being teachable. Maar is die twistgesprekke, wat sê ons, wat is uh, twistgesprekke in Engels, that? Uh, conversations where we just argue about things. Oh, yeah, is jylle met my? Hallo? No, don't die now, are you still here? Okay. Oh man, we can so easily have a lot of time that we spend because we, we decide in the inner circle, what will I allow? When I go to the rugby, in, in the circle, I, I'm okay. If we preach for 40 minutes and take a short break and then we preach for 40 minutes again, Papi, don't you go and try that in the church. Ha! It's just not possible. Even though Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, Moses and those guys, and those other guys had to stand in the desert, man, for how many hours? I want to know that. We must, the sound man must go and ask first thing in heaven. How did you get it right without a sound system? That one person can speak and millions can hear him. I don't know. But in any case, New Testament the same. They would go and they start with a book and they preach, and they keep on preaching for the whole day. For all day. And then they, the preaching was so exciting that the guy in the window started to sleep. And he fell off dead. Boom. What an amazing, encouraging word. The guys were so excited by the word that the guy started to sleep and he died. No. Oh, how did he die? No. The preacher was preaching a word. And it was so boring that the guy fell asleep and he fell off and he died. Hmm. Amazing. But you know what happened? He fell off. Oh, oh, let's stop the sermon. Go out. Let's quickly raise him from the dead. Put him back. And then carry on. I think then the people listened. <laughs> Just so by the way, let's raise somebody from the dead. But the, the focus is not raising him from the dead. The focus is the word must be in, implanted in your hearts. So after we raise the man from the dead, we just carry on with a focus. We carry on with a plan. We carry on with a purpose why we are here. 
and raising the debt was just so, so by the way, <laughs> so that we can get back to the purpose. Please, my brother, my sister, understand what God has for you. Amen. This is Malachi about accuracy and humility. Man, we can go on, yeah, for a Sunday and a half, but I'm going to pass that. We maybe talk about that in seven weeks' time. The, the book just before that is Zechariah. With Zechariah, we write productivity and centrality. What are we talking about? There's two books of the prophets, of all the prophets in the Old Testament, that has such clear visions, where these guys have such clear visions about Jesus. Actually, no, sorry. Yeah. Daniel about the end time, but not so much about Jesus in his coming. But Isaiah and Zechariah talking about Jesus in his first coming, and Zechariah also in his second coming. In the one part, he's talking about rejoice, rejoice, be glad, rejoice exceedingly, because your king is coming, he's riding on a donkey. Oh man, they were supposed to see that. Rejoice. This is hundreds of years before Jesus came. But this man could see that. And then at the end, he says, and Jesus, and, and there's the man, and he will come. And he will stand on the Mount of Olives that was split in two. And he will be king over the earth. Let's talk about Jesus in his second coming. The centrality of Christ in your life. For that, you, Christ in his first coming, Christ in his second coming. You know where you came from and who you are because of the cross. You know where you're going to and with your expectation for, his, for the second coming. Are you with me? You start that business because you are crucified with Christ. And from the place of being crucified with Christ, you can do nothing except through Him. The first coming. But through your business, in your business, you will not become so busy that you lose sight of the second coming. Hello? But become so busy that you don't expect Him to come tomorrow in your meeting Tomorrow in what you do, tomorrow in your success, tomorrow in your challenge, he will come, but then you need to understand him in where you came from and where you are going with God. If you don't know where you're going with God, what are you doing? What a hell of a waste of a life, if I can say it like that. Find out who you are. Found out, find out. Isaiah is the rock that you were cut from. Find out who you are because of the cross. And find out who's the one coming. Because he's there. He's in your future. And he's excited about tomorrow. He's waiting for you tomorrow. He's waiting for you next year. In what he has for you. And he's excited about your future. You find him and you will be excited about your future. You'll be excited about tomorrow. If you expect him tomorrow. Why will you just be fearing tomorrow, being frustrated, or just, ah, another day, at the end of the day. Thank you, Lord, this day, we are finished with this day. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Lord, holiday is coming. <laughs> oh, we are normal. But I have an expectation for him, please. Please, productivity, centrality. Centrality, bring Christ in the central of what you have. And if you understand that, then you will be productive according to God's definition of productivity. You can do a lot of things. But as you know, Zechariah 4, 6, not by power, not by might. He doesn't say not by the power from hell and the power from the devil. No, he's talking about your power. Not by your power, not by your might and your might and your power is not necessarily from hell. But it's not through your natural power that you will be productive. But it's when your spirit and the Holy Spirit is linked. And there's that interaction, there's connection, there's that partnership. You will be productive. You are still here? I see somebody going in a deep sleep under the word. I take that as an encouragement. Okay, productivity. Uh, uh, are you still here with me? 
And uh, um, that is in Zechariah 4, 6. You must write it down. There's, there's 20 scriptures with each of these books, but we're not going to go into that. Nobody say hallelujah now. Okay, no, no, no. In all circumstances, you must say that. Okay, productivity, 4 verse 6. 4 verse 7, 8, and 10. He's talking about, what is this mountain in front of you? You'll become a plane, and you'll have success. And the hands that laid the foundation, that hands will complete it. What God has for you, what you started with God, you will complete it. There will be productivity. There's a lot of scripture about this, but please go and start and, and look into that. I hope you will do that. And even in chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, he says, Behold the man, behold the man, he's going to build his house. He's going to build the temple, and he will rule and reign. He will rule and reign. That's the man, Jesus Christ. Behold the man, watch the man, look at the man, keep inside the man, Amplified says. There's a whole teaching about that, also two, three Sundays. But look at that, please, man. Okay, you have Zechariah, productivity, centrality as a focus. Are you still there? You say, ha! Ah. Okay. I didn't hear you, no, say it alone. <laughs> okay, Haggai. Haggai. Priority. And effectivity. It's priority and effectivity. He says four, five times in the book. God says through the prophet. Give careful thought to your ways. Other translation, consider your ways. I think New King James. No, no, no. Yeah, New King James. Consider your ways. NIV. Give careful thought to your ways. And talking about not for... To condemn you. Oh, taking the old cow out. No. No, 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 no. It's about evaluate. Evaluate. So that you can see, is my priorities, are they right? Yes or no? Evaluate. Give careful thought of your ways. And then the whole book, in maybe, I don't know how many, 60% of the book saying, you try to do this, and nothing happened. You try to do this, and only a few. Yet you did this, but... That didn't happen. Why? Because the priority is wrong. In the beginning he says about, you say it's not yet time to build the house of God, and you are wrong. The time has come already. So priority of what is that what you built with the God for his house. I'm not saying you will come and build the church. That's not what I'm saying. It has to do with the life and how you as a living stone in the body of Christ are effective. Are you here? So with that, what I'm saying is, get your priorities right by considering and be give careful, careful. Everybody say careful. That means you really stop it and you sit and you give careful thought. You think seriously, effectively about what you are doing. Give careful thought about your ways. And then let Holy Spirit speak to you. Then... You can be effective. There's no effective lifestyle for you if you don't put into your lifestyle a life where you evaluate. And give careful thought. God give you people to help you. So make sure. Make sure. That people speak into your life. At one stage, uh, it was a season where Creari had to go into the nations. And we went to more than 30 nations every year. For like three, four years. And everything was just like booming in a certain way. And I just started to get this check. And when we get into the pastor's meeting, they would just say, oh, wow. You, and the guys are there. And some guys are there. And some guys are there. And I got this check. And I said, I don't want to hear anything for the next month or so. Please, let us just hear from God. What are we not doing correct? Not because he wants to judge us. But we must give careful thought for our ways, because we are not God. We need to grow from glory to glory. We need to grow, and in God loving us, there will be discipline. Hello? So even the mentor that I had, I sit in would say in meetings, don't, no, don't tell me anything. I know encouragement. What is the three things you think we must work on at this stage? Are you with me? Make sure you have those people in your life that you can love them even once you want to kill them. Because discipline does not seem pleasant at that moment. 
So people that you can even get angry with and you, because of what they say, but you still love them enough and you are connected in covenant with them that you will walk the road. But get into their face and tell them to get into your face. Because you see yourself and not as an illegitimate child, but as a true child of God. And if you see yourself not as a fake illegitimate child, then you position yourself for discipleship. Because every child that he accepts, he disciplines. Amen. You are still with me? Effectivity, we're not going to go into that. But bottom line, in, uh, even in the second chapter, it says, God stirred the spirit, their spirit. So that's the essence of your life. From that place you worship, spirit and truth. But you need to be stirred in your spirit. In your spirit you must be awake to do what you must do, not because you think it's a good idea, but because you know in your spirit God said it. God said it. And then he said, okay, if your priorities are right, to me, the, the gold, the silver, everything belongs to me. So you don't worry about that. You don't work for the gold and the silver. That belongs to me. All the cattle on all the mountains belongs to me. The nations will bring, the wealth of the nations will come to the church. If the church will grow up and not run for the wealth of the nations, but run for the house of God, the nations will bring the wealth. When Solomon started to build the house of God and focused in God's wisdom on God's house, the nations brought the resources. Amen. Right, next one. Before Haggai, we find Zechariah. Zechariah, connectivity, humility. Humility to seek. Talking about seeking. If you say seek the Lord, if you say seek the Lord, he's not seeking him for an answer, first of all. You seek him because you, are, you walk in humility. You know you need him. You need him. So from a place of humility, you can honor him. From a place of humility, you respect him and the fear of God works. But from a place of humility, you come into humility because without God, you are nothing. You don't want to do anything else. I'm just giving you the one scripture, uh, connectivity. Everybody knows that, Zechariah. Zephaniah 3 verse 17. The Lord your God is with you, mighty to save, take great delight in you, quiet you with his love, rejoice over you of singing. Connectivity is understanding the emotions that God has in his heart for you. That his emotions and your emotions, his desires and your desires become one. So that's where God purifies your desires, your emotions, your life. That what is driving you to be driven by his love, led by his peace, his joy as your strength. For that to happen, connectivity. Everybody say connectivity. And that connectivity is your heart, his heart. Otherwise, you just do because you must. That's a demon of religion. Just do it because you must. When you are in rubbish, you don't know how to hear his but, but then you just respect the word, then you do because you must. You do because you must. You get into the word, you do because you must. You move to his word because you must, 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 must. Because I want, because I want, because I want, because I want. But many times it starts with because you must. And you freak out because you don't want to. Because your heart is in rubbish and you want, just want to do that. Now you start because you must. And you walk away from all that ha ha other voices. Because you must. Not because you just want to. Now that's where the fight is. To walk towards the word and into the word. You with me? Next one. For the sake of the time. Have a cook. Stability, objectivity. Stability, why? Chapter 1, Habakkuk, one major tantrum. How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Arrogant. Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you look me, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate the wrongdoing? Distraction. Violence before me. Strife. Conflict. Here's a man. And he's throwing a, quite a tantrum. Stability. And that is when you feel all those stuff. Chapter 2 verse 1. He make a decision. He will not stand in his tantrum. He will walk away from his tantrum. He says, I will stand on my watchtower. 
and I will see what he is saying. I will stand my watch. I will stand on my watch. I will stand above my circumstances to look down at my circumstances. But it will be all about him. And I will stand there to write down, even if it takes longer, the answer. And so I will stand to see what he's saying and so that I will know how to answer him. So that I will know how to answer him. Oh, yeah, you could say what you want. Here there was tantrum. But suddenly, yes, you make that choice. Guys, ladies, you make that choice. You get out of chapter 1 into chapter 2. And you become silent. And you stand. You see. And then, if you see what he's saying, you will hear how you're supposed to speak to him. You will hear what you must answer him. Oh, that stability. And so that in chapter 3, you're not going to God for things to change, first of all. And you are ineffective. You can come in. Oh, nobody knocking. That's all. <laughs> um, but chapter 3, that will say, even though, even though, hello, everybody say even though. Yeah. Nothing changes. No fear in the crowds. What's, what's fear in the crowds? No Life stuck in the... You, know, you don't even know. <laughs> even though nothing changed. If nothing changed, still, I will hold on. Still, I will make it just, just, but I will make it. No. Even though nothing changed, I will rejoice in the Lord. Are you out of your mind? How can you rejoice when nothing changed? Still, I will rejoice in the Lord because He makes me strong. He let me... Walk like the deer up onto the hill. And that, those mountain goats, they can just run. I don't know if you saw a video or something about that. It's just like, boom, on top. He makes me stand on the mountain. I know I can rejoice because now I'm standing in my watchtower looking down at my circumstances. He's the one that let me stand on my mountain. Hello? To rejoice in him. He's my strength. He's my everything. Stability, objectivity. Because you're looking down into your situation. Why? Because you gave your life to Christ. Crucified with Christ. Died with Christ. Buried with Christ. Raised with Christ. And seated with Christ in heavenly places. And seated with Christ in heavenly places. From that place, you look down into your situation. Are you with me? Please, we are going for a landing. Please, be with me. Nahum. Nah how do you say that in English? Nahum. Nahum. Okay. Finality, clarity. Everybody say finality, clarity. I'll just give you this. I'll just give you one verse. Chapter 1, verse 15. Write that. Look, there on the mountains, the feet are the one who bring good news, who proclaims peace. Look on the mountain, the guys that work says, look, there that lady is coming. Look, this guy is coming. Look, that guy is coming. And he will bring the good news. There's clarity when you come into the situation because you will bring the news from God. And there will be a message of hope. You will not chat them in. But when you come, when there's clarity in your life, my brother, then the finality of what you say will be there. Why? Because what you say is from God. When God is saying something, it's final. Hello? So the finality is in the good news. Who has the final say in your inner circle? Who has the final say tomorrow? Your compromising heart, your temptation, your flesh, your rejection, your hurt, your reasoning, your religion. Who will bring the final say? But you need to decide. There's finality when I hear what God is saying. When I have his word, I'm looking, I'm reading the final say from God. This is bringing finality in my life for every day. He will have the final say. Not my hurt, not my anger, no. 
But there's clarity when I come on the mountains. When I come from the place of the mountains, I want to say like Moses, you like want to say like when Jesus came from the mountain. When you came from your mountain, from the mountain you must come with a message. But you stay in the rubbish, you will come with a certain message. You compromise with the devil and the temptation on the mountain, okay, you come with a different message. But from the mountain with a message. Let's say from the mountain with a message. But the world will look at you. South Africa is looking at the church, but the church is not coming with the good news. Too many times coming with a judgment and with this. I'm not saying compromise the word. No. But where is the feet on the mountains of the church coming into the nations with the good news? When last did you lead somebody to the Lord? When last did you speak to somebody about what God is saying? Even if it's just walking past him, you're going to buy your bread and milk, and then you tell somebody, but remember to drink the milk of the word. No, they're going to think you're freaky. Oh, remember the bread of life is Jesus. We did that with some of the students and some of the leaders, and I did it with Jaden. He was very, I don't know, excitedly embarrassed. But, uh, but that was when he was quite younger. And we're going to buy a few bread, and I'm, we go and hear from God, for, I must give this bread to somebody and say, remember, a thousand times more than this, Jesus Christ is the bread of life. Go and eat the Bible in the right way. Go and read your Bible. That's a thousand times more than this bread that I'm giving you now. You walk away. That's all. Remember the other time we gave the bananas, hey? Who were here when we gave the bananas? A few. I told the guys, okay, we trust God for the finances. If you believe that, uh, yeah, give us a thousand rand and we're going to give a thousand bananas away. And then you take one banana each and you give it to somebody and say, just remember, you didn't come from a baboon. <laughs> Don't be an atheist. Eat the banana, but never think you came from a baboon. The creator of the universe created him. You look like him. Don't have baboon manners and then you give the the, the banana to him. I, I don't know what that guy would think when he's peeling that and eating that and say, okay, be creative, men. Okay, clarity, finality. Micah. Micah. Micah, are you here? Not Micah, but are you guys here? Teachability, openness. Openness with two N's. Two S's. Is that so? Most probably. Okay. Good. Maybe we learn something. Teachable. All right. My car teachability, openness. I'm reading you one verse. <sighs> it's a, let's call it an hour teaching. Will you write down my, my car four verse two? Many nations. Everybody say many nations. Many nations will come and say. They will say. The nations will say. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, there where God reigns, there where God has the final say on his mountain where he dwells. To the temple of God of Jacob, he will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. He will teach us. My brother, my sister, that, that, that revival didn't come yet. When the nation, the word says, South Africa is saying, let us go to the house of God. The scripture is saying it's going to happen. When Ethiopia will say, let us go to the house of God and let, us, let him teach us his way so that we can walk in it. You've been taught nothing if you don't walk in it. You walk out here and you heard some stuff. If you don't walk in it, you've been taught nothing. When you read your Bible, when somebody is teaching you, You've been taught only when you walk in it. Let us go up to the mountain. Let us, him teach us his way so that we can walk in it. If you've been taught and you have it here, but it's not in your feet, that is knowledge puffs up. That becomes pride. That's, that's intellectual knowledge. Because Satan, the devil, all the demons, they have it. Oh, you got all the information like the devil has. And the devil's give you... As long as you don't walk in it. The devil cannot walk in it. He can walk in his demonic ways. He can have it all here. But if, 
It's only you, only you, only you that can walk with God. Adam, where are you? I've called you to walk with me. I've called you to walk with me in the Garden of Eden. Walk with your God. Walk with your God. How? Let him teach you his ways. And you've been taught when you walk in his ways. Open it. We're going to leave it there. I see I must hasten. Um, just give your neighbor a smack. A holy one. Do it in love and say, hey, wake up. We are going for a landing. Jonah. Jonah, you'll be awake if you are found in a, in a, in a fish. I know. You're going to ask him also one day, hey, how was it <laughs> in the fish? Okay. Jonah. Honesty, obedience. Honesty and obedience. Otherwise, you can say missionary and honesty. I would like that also more because he's, he's rhyming. He's rhyming. Missionary and honesty. We always say Jonah is about obeying or not obeying. First of all, I want to say, my brother, it's about honesty. It's about honesty. This guy, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, he got the call from God. He's supposed to go there. But he decided, no, I will not obey. I will not obey. You know why? Many times God tells you to do something, but what if he doesn't do what he said he's going to do? You do this because you believe God is saying this is going to happen. And then it doesn't happen. And the next time you don't necessarily want to do something, I don't necessarily want to go and talk to somebody about the Lord, because what if they don't listen? Like the previous time. That guy sweared at me. He said, or whatever. You know? You look for opportunity. You look for opportunity. And you can enjoy some of it also. Remember I told you the story a hundred times of the, of the colored guy that I just previously, when I would be frustrated, I would, were going through something, try it. Somebody, if you tried it, come and tell me. I would go in the street and I would just go and tell a lot of people. I'm going to walk around the block and if I must tell a hundred people or fifty people or twenty people, God has a precious plan for you. Or you are precious to God. God really loves you. Just going to say to a lot of people on the street, I come back so, so, so excited. <laughs> Frustration gone. Just like that. It's like a trick. No, they're not a trick. So, so I went on the street this time, and I said, God's going to speak to you. God's going to speak to you. And I just, <laughs> I said, God's going to speak to you. And I walk on, not, not having to start a conversation. And this one time I said, actually, God has an appointment with you. Yes, now on earth, hopefully, otherwise after death, unto judgment. So I walked past this one guy, I said, God has an appointment with you. And I walked on by this, it was a colored guy, he stopped and said, Hey, asa kan hier moeilijkheid? And we had a wonderful conversation. That's one of hundred stories I can tell you. But, oh man, oh man. Go and put out the gospel there. You know, when you're frustrated, next time the devil says, oh, we mustn't make that guy frustrated because he's going to preach the gospel on the street. <laughs> That'd be so rather. Okay, but this man, he got the word of God. He said, and he ran away. Why? You know, in chapter 4, verse 2, he said, I knew that you're a gracious God. I knew that most probably this is not going to happen. I knew you're a gracious God that will forgive and can forgive. That's why I didn't want to go and fled away. Uh, fled to what? Tarsus, ne? What side black? Yeah. That's what he said in chapter 4. Because I knew. I'm just going to do this now, but it's not necessarily going to happen. You just do because God said it. Not because... You, you are not secure about the outcome. Just do because God said it. Boom. That's, that's it. You know, no? But the first place of turning was not obedience. The place of turning was this guy had the guts to be honest. 
there's a storm. And sometimes, my brother, my sister, at your workplace or in your business, there's a storm because of your disobedience. There's a storm not sent by the devil, sent by God, because the man of God is disobedient. There's a storm in a nation because the church is disobedient. And if the church can come into a place of honesty and repent from that what is selfish, then a nation could have a breakthrough many times. So it's not the church that must fight against the storm. It's those knoller, those, those other guys that is not nearly part of the, 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 the faith in that place that's with him there on the ship. All those other knoller calling out to their gods and their, all their idols and all their huaras. It's not their fault. It's the man of God's fault. It's the child of God. It's his fault that there's a storm. In a nation, there will be storms because the church is supposed to wake up and come into place of honesty, evaluate their lives, and change. But God, by His mercy, is going to help us. Amen. So this storm, I mean, the economy is, is going. I mean, these guys, they throw out all their possessions, everything, and they are in a state. Things in the world can be in a state. Things in this nation, in the city, can be in a state. Why? Why is the devil stealing everything? No, he's not stealing everything. But maybe the children of God must come into a place of honesty and brokenness and walk into obedience with what God has for them. So what happens? Excellent, Jonah. He has the guts to be honest. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I serve the living God. And this situation, because of me, is because of my disobedience. That's why you experiencing the storm. What you need to do is throw me over. Whoa. Whoa. Some unselfishness where he thought about himself and he went on that ship. Next moment, he forgot about himself. He said, throw me over. The guys, those knoller, they didn't even want to do that. No, they tried to carry on. And then in the end, they said, May your God not punish us for if we throw you over. And they threw him over, and what happened? <laughs> the storm came. I think they had a message for their families and for the rest of their lives about who is the living God. How their idols and their gods did absolutely nothing. But how, when they threw this man over, when he was disobedient to his God, that God you need to fear, that God you need to respect, are you with me? Oh, my brother, my sister, come into the place of honesty with yourself and such a lot of storms in your life could, could disappear. And stop fighting the devil who sent the storm. Don't honor him that he sent the storm. But be honest. God, where am I missing you? Where am I missing you? Don't take condemnation, but where am I missing you? Help me to lay down my life in the right way and be honest about who you are and what God has for other people. Okay, so that was chapter 1 and chapter 2. There he is in the, in the fish. And then after he was thrown out of the fish, he said, in my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the, of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. That sounds logic, hey? but it's not. Because he said this not after the fish thrown him out. He said it before the time. Inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. In the deep of the realm of the dead, I called, and you listened to my cry. Whoa. So God listening to me is not, is not I don't believe it after my circumstances changed. After he did what I asked him to do, then he listened to me. God listens to you. Everything. But he does not necessarily answer in the way that you would want to see it. But this man understood that. God is hearing my everything. God is aware of my situation and he hears what I'm saying. He hears my cry. He, is, he, has, he has heard it. What he's going to do about it, I don't know. But God has heard your cry. God has listened to you already. Don't say he listened to me. 
He heard my cry when he changed the circumstances in the way that you wanted it to be changed. Man, great. This man in a certain way of honesty. And at the end of the day, chapter 3, I'm finishing with that one. Here God comes again and he said to him again, go therefore to Nineveh. My brother and my sister, God is the God of a second chance in principle. I know we, we had already a thousand chances, but I'm talking about that he will bring you into the place that he will trust you again. He will put you in the fish. Yes, he will put you in the valley where you think you're going to die. But when you cry out to him, when you acknowledge him, you acknowledge him. Not first of all to change your circumstance, but just acknowledge him for who he is in your life. Acknowledge him for who he is in your life. God says, I trust you. Even though you messed up, I will still trust you. And he sent him again. And he sent him. Hello. He sent him again. May God help you. May God help you to walk in honesty before God. But allow him to bring you in the place that you will go with the message that God has for you. And there he went. Within 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. Within 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. 40 days, you're going to be destroyed. You could sit on a mountain, and God proved him wrong. Oh, what about my image? I said all this time, I went through all this hell uh, to bring your message, and then you didn't do anything of what I said. <laughs> and God said, why are you angry? Two times, eh? God said to Jonah, why are you angry? Why are you angry? Even God teasing him, if I can say that with all respect, with a, with a tree and then this worm, the whole tree, and then the tree is gone. And, and God again says, why are you angry? <laughs> God knew he's going to be angry. <laughs> can I not do whatever I want to do? God said to him. I will hear you. I will deliver you. I will forgive you. I will trust you again. And I, I did that. But how can you be angry and say, I must only do what you, and according to your perspective, must happen? I am God, and I will do whatever I want to do. Come to know that God. Amen. Ubadia. Ubadia. Oh, even worse. Say again. Obadiah. Obadiah. Oh, but that A is a uh. Hallelujah. Okay. Selfishness. <sighs> familiarity. Brotherly familiarity. All I'm going to say, this one part in verse 10. Because of the violence against your brother, because of that, you will be covered with shame. You will be destroyed. In the day you stood aloof. While strangers carried off his wealth, and foreigners entered his gates, and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them, because you did nothing. Familiarity. You can be so familiar with your brothers and sister going through a lot of hell, going through turmoil, going through a lot of stuff. My brother and my sister, but, but God says that's not going to happen. You cannot become so familiar with them. That you're not willing to be unselfish and help that person. I know we cannot help everybody. But you need to hear from God. You're not, put, you're not being placed here to live for yourself. Jesus came and he lived for us. And he gave himself for us. Are you with me? Getting to that place. But there was quite a... Yeah. Uh, what's the word? Prophecy brought against these guys because of their absolute selfishness and the way they were just okay. They were just okay while, by seeing others in turmoil. I say even more, I speak to myself with Ukraine and what's happening there and with people around us. Man, oh man, you, we, we, we need to understand. Even yeah, back in the township, there's some guys that are really going through hell. I know there's also some other suburbs where a lot of, uh, especially some of the whiteies, also going through a lot of hell. But guys, what are we? What type of life do we have? There's a lot of brothers and sisters, and they're going without food for a week, or, and what? And their kids, 
going to school. They cannot, they cannot focus because they cannot concentrate. That's why a lot of schools started the food programs. Because the teachers saw that these children can learn not, they can't learn anything because they cannot concentrate because they are hungry. That's how many of the food programs start, started. You need to hear what is your contribution, even if it starts with prayer. Even if you put a reminder and you're going to pray for those in need. Nine o'clock at night for five minutes. Five minutes of prayer. And that God will supernaturally provide in many ways for those guys even. If you don't have the means to do something about it. You come into that place of unselfishness, please guys. Are you with me? Because then you start to have God's heart. Then you start to have his heart. And then you start to think the way he thinks. You with me? I remember, I remember 30, what, 32 years ago, maybe, Bible school. Went to PE. There were a couple Afrikaans, a couple with four kids. And they worked with the white street kids. They were about 30, 40 street kids in PE at that stage. They said, we struggle for months, for months, to place one or two kids with the whiteies. They said, I can walk half a day into the township and I will have a place for everyone, for these white kids with them. And they will cut off that amount of porridge for that child because they know what it is to go through certain things. And they said to me, where is the gold according to God? He said, to, he said to me, the gold is in the township, not here in the suburb. Ah, hello. And I said, we, we mustn't judge one another. No, 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 no rubbish. But I'm just saying, I will never in my life forget that, that moment. May God help us not to be selfish, that we come under judgment because of our familiarity and how we just are okay with people around us just suffering and we, we are just okay with it. That's not right. Amen. Okay, we're going for, are we at the last one? Yes. Almost, beamos, siamos, oh, second last one. Are you, are you still alive? Just, 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 just stay alive just for... Four and a half minutes. Amos. Expectancy, dependency. Okay. All I'm saying with that, dependency, I'm going to just give you Amos 3.3. 3. Will two walk together unless they have agreed? Agreed. God says, we've agreed to walk together. We've agreed that we will do this together. Not that you will go on your own and do whatever you want. We've agreed to walk together. Dependency. You agree with who you're going to walk. You agree with who, what voice will speak inside of you. You agree that you and your hurt, you and your disappointment, you and your, your, your offense, you and your judgment, you and your whatever will walk together. Or you agree as you walk out here that you and God will walk together and you will hear and understand his word. That then in the dependency and expectancy, I expect God to speak to you. He says in verse 7, in chapter 3, he says, I will do nothing unless I reveal it through my prophets. So God says, God wants to reveal to you what he's going to do. He's not going to explain it to you. And when he sometimes he tells you what he's going to do, it could freak you out even more. Yeah, so it's not like when you know what he's going to say, then you will be so at peace. Sometimes when you would hear what he's going to do, he's going to freak you out even more because he wants you to be dependent on him. Are you with me still? So all I'm saying, this dependency, I have an expectation that God wants to speak to you. I have a certain expectancy. But that in what he's going to say, he's going to challenge you to be dependent on him. I'm leaving that. Are we now with the last one? Yes, Joel. Strategies. Can you believe it? We have it. It's a strategy, but strategies is also okay. And sensitivity. Sensitivity. That's the last one. What I'm saying with that, what I'm saying with that is this is the chapter with that prophecy that when uh, the Holy Spirit fell, 
on the day of Pentecost, then Peter stood up and he told all the Jews and everybody saying, whoa, these guys are full of, they are drunk. What the heck is happening here? What chaos? And Peter stood up and he took the prophecy from Joel. And he said, no, as it was written through the prophet Joel, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all mankind and your sons and your daughters, they will prophesy and your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams, even of your, on my, your servants. I will pour out my spirit and a lot of things will happen. Wonders in the sky and on the earth, sun will be dark and the moon turned into blood. Blah, 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 blah. And with all this shaking, all this shaking, everything shaken and everything in chaos. Last verse. And everybody who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Boom. Holy Spirit's going to do something. But you need to be sensitive to be part of the move. You will see it happen, but you will not be part of it. You still go to heaven. But if you want to be part of it, you need to develop a sensitivity for God's strategy. A sensitivity for God's strategy. Because the children must be full of the word. When they open their mouths, they, the accurate word of God will be there. This is what's supposed to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. The generation is going to rise up. And we must expect a revival in so many ways to start with the children. That the word of God will be on their lips. Young men will see the visions. Oh, you want to do this, you want to do that, you don't want to do that. Make sure the vision is from God. Old men will dream dreams because they're waiting to go to heaven. No, dream dreams. They will see the global perspective. They will have the wisdom of what is the bigger picture of what God has for us. That's the dream. All the people with the wisdom is not just to calm down the young men with a vision. No, it's to see, bring the global picture through wisdom into the situation. Young men, you go by faith in the vision. But make sure that as a child, you've learned how to have God's word on your mouth. Child in you with the word of God on your mouth. The strength in you for the vision. The wisdom in you for the global picture that you can see. God is going to move with his spirit into the nations. And I pray that you will be part of it. I pray that I will be part of it as we yield because of a sensitivity that you develop in the spirit. Come and do this in our lives, please, Lord. We need you. God, I pray that we will understand how you're going to do it. God, I pray that we will be open. God, help us to walk away from all those other rubbish voices. God, we choose to come in the place of prayer, not to experience what you're going to do, but through prayer to walk away from the voices and walk closer to your word and walk, walk closer to your voice. Help us, teach us how to pray, even pray in tongues, but pray, God, and pray your word so that we can walk closer, closer to you. We will not honor those other voices anymore. Forgive us, Lord, for bringing those other spirits into the inner circle with their voices, that they had value in our lives. God, we choose today that your voice will be the final say, will be precious. We value your voice and that as the final voice in Jesus' name. So we pray as a group of people, as we agree and as we agree, so will it be according to your will and your word. We trust you for that, Father, that you will help us with that. That we can speak into our lives a sensitivity, a stability, all these facets, God. That we will stand with accuracy to prepare the way for you tomorrow, Lord, to manifest yourself in our studies, in our workplace, in our relationships, in our challenges, in our success, in our failures, in that place. God, help us to expect you in the wilderness as we walk into the wilderness with your word and believing only your word. We thank you for that, Father, that you come and do it in our lives. In Jesus' name, so we pray. Amen, amen, amen.